Good morning and welcome to the uh, One Investment Call with MFS uh, discussing our bond and money market portfolios. Thank you for calling in to learn more about uh, what we're doing on our side with the, uh, our bond portfolios and the money market portfolio, which are, are managed by our external manager, uh, MFS. The, uh, the names of our portfolios uh, changed as, the, as of the, the beginning of April. The government, sorry, the, uh, the bond portfolio was uh, rebranded the One Canadian Government Bond Portfolio. And our universe corporate bond portfolio was rebranded the One Canadian Corporate Bond Portfolio. The money market portfolio was uh, uh, name was was unaltered. Now we have with us uh, two individuals from MFS. MFS is a partner with uh, One Investment. We've had a, a deep relationship going back actually a couple of decades. Uh, they manage the, the three mandates I just mentioned. These particular mandates are designed specifically for municipal investors. The portfolios themselves are structured to be compliant with the uh, Municipal Act uh, and other regulations. And the securities that are held within the portfolios are selected to, again, be uh, compliant and ensure that the portfolios are on side uh, of, the, of the regulations. By the nature of these portfolios and the construction, the portfolios are high quality, uh, portfolios. They are conservative in natures uh, and they have a uh, very high credit quality uh, securities within them. We have two, two individuals to, to, to talk more about what's going on in the portfolios and the structure and answer any questions. Both are uh, chartered financial analysts and both have uh, a couple of decades of, of experience in the market. So uh, with that, I will pass it across to, uh, to Darren and uh, Sami to uh, discuss further about the portfolios. Thanks, Keith. Good morning, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to engage with you this morning. My name is Darren Patrick, and I'm a managing director for MFS's Canadian Institutional Client Relationship Team. With me today, as Keith mentioned, is Somi Coley. Somi is co-portfolio co manager on your three fixed income strategies that we'll talk about today, and also a member of our asset mix team. Before we begin, Somi and I, and all of MFS, really appreciate these are very challenging times, not only here in Canada, but around the world. So first and foremost, we hope you and your families are well and staying healthy. The spread of the coronavirus has disrupted homes, schools, workplaces, and certainly, as, as you well know, the capital markets have become increasingly volatile. That's why I want to reassure you, reassure you that MFS, our focus is and always has been and always will be our clients like the One Fund. That said, we hope today's conversation will provide you with some context and perspective that will resonate. Uh, hopefully that you can share with your community stakeholders and what's transpired in the fixed income markets thus far in 2020. So you know how the next 30 minutes will go. I'll start off by explaining why MFS aligns around clients with respect to risk collaboration, and time. I'll then describe how we are organized around the world and how we bring ideas into the One Fund portfolios. I'll touch on our relationship, as Keith mentioned, going back to 1997, highlighting key milestones along our partnership along the way. And finally, before turning things over to Somi to talk about your portfolios, um, I'll summarize the structure of your three funds, as, as, as Keith pointed out, and highlight how they performed in a risk return environment over the last 10 years ended March 31. There are a lot of words on this page, but the message is simple. At MFS, regardless if it's an equity mandate, a fixed income mandate, or a quantitative mandate, our commitment to clients is around creating value for them over time. And what that really means is how we step beyond our role as one of your investment managers and step into the role as one of your partners. In a few slides, I'll talk about how we've done that over the last 23 years, uh, highlighting milestones along the way, and of, of course, excited about what the future holds as well. We do this, we, we deliver on this commitment to you in three ways. The first, I'll start on the bottom left, is called Collective Expertise. Uh, we built one of the industry's first independent research departments in 1932, and so we believe as fundamental bottom-up security selectors doing our own research matters. 
we believe we have an analysis advantage in the marketplace. We'll talk about that today, how we leverage ideas across the globe and get ideas into clients' portfolios is something I think that makes MFS truly unique. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we share ideas across equity, across fixed income, regardless of the mandates we manage for you, and really it gets a full picture in terms of how we can deliver value to clients. If we move to the right in the middle of the page, the second way we deliver on commitment, our commitment to clients is through leveraging time as an asset. We really do think long-term. We believe delivering sustainable value for one fund or any other client that we, we work with is not a short-term endeavor. It, this is critical, particularly today, given that market cycles need time to run their course. And as our experience is fundamental bottom-up security sectors, as I mentioned, we've been through multiple market cycles and we give that benefit of time to let these insights play out. We do not trade on trends and news, and we believe this really does erode long-term returns and creates a misalignment with what you're trying to get at. And lastly, how we deliver value to our clients and to the one fund is focusing on risk first from the bottom up. What I mean by that is we really do understand every security's contribution to the portfolios of overall risk as we add them or remove them from the portfolio. We have a fundamental grasp of, of the, the portfolio's risk picture. And from that perspective, we're, a lot, we we're able to construct portfolios that are tailored to our clients' unique needs and objectives. And I think that makes it a very uh, important piece of, of what we're delivering to the one fund uh, and, and have delivered over the last uh, 23 years. I referenced this earlier, but this is really, as, as you can see, a map of the world with nine cities highlighted. And really why we have done that is to so, show you how we are aligned, or, or should say organized around the world across our equity and fixed trading platforms. So these nine cities that you see in these boxes represent where our trading desks are, where our portfolio managers like Somi and others on our team sit, our analysts and research, I should say our analysts and traders. We've given you some numbers here as at the end of last year in terms of how we're organized. Uh, we do have other offices around the world. I'm actually in our Vancouver office. We have offices in Germany as well, but this is not the point. The point on this, this slide is to show you that we are global but we all think and act local. And when we get into your portfolios, we'll, 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 make that, uh, we'll, we'll make that real for you today. I'm gonna to touch on this very briefly before I move on. I'd be remiss to say that we do not consider sustainability. Sustainability really is something that is fundamental to our core as an investment manager. I put three graphics on this page to show you how we integrate E, S, and G factors into our portfolios, ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance factors. We believe focusing on material ESG factors is critical to how we invest and to how we deliver value to clients over time. And I will just turn your attention quickly on the, on the, in the middle slide. This is uh, our, if you will, report card from the UNPRI or the Principles for Responsible Investment. We've been a signatory for, with them for uh, close to 10 years, close to 11 years now. Uh, and we're, in 2019, we achieved A or better categories or ratings in every single category you can see across the board, something we're very proud about. I, I wanted to highlight our 23-year relationship on page four. Um, this goes back, of course, to 1997 when the inception uh, of our relationship started with the short bond mandate. Uh, prior to 2011, MFS was known as McLean Budden. And so you can see this relationship goes far back and beyond, uh, highlighting the points where we have helped and worked with one fund to uh, talk to the regulators with respect to the act. Uh, to give advice and give thoughts and, and to really partner with you in terms of how we went to, uh, to, to tailor to portfolios uh, th uh, with you over, over time. So really something we're proud of and something that we're very happy about in terms of our long history of partnership with you uh, across the board. Giving you a, a snapshot of Somi, of course, on the, on the right side. Now he's co-portfolio manager with Josh Marston in our Boston office, and this is the investment team that is responsible uh, for the three strategies that we manage for you. Of course, I say responsible, but what I mean by that is um, Josh and Somi leveraged the entire platform that I mentioned earlier a few slides ago, uh, uh, below and additional resources. 
as co-PMs or co-portfolio managers on your strategies, Josh and Somi leverage ideas that are generated across our fixed income and equity platforms. And I've given you some uh, statistics there that we could talk about. But really, I think what's important as we go along today is to talk about how that matters and why that matters to the one fund by way of example and context in your portfolios. Keith mentioned at the outset that the names of the funds have changed in the recent weeks. And, and what I've done here is I've shown you those, those names, obviously in three separate rows. I wanted to summarize for you uh, the statistics, or I should say the, the criteria of each of your portfolios, your money market portfolio, the Canadian government portfolio, and the Canadian corporate portfolio. I've included assets and inception dates on the very far right-hand side of the page. As you can see, we manage over $500 million for, for one fund across these three strategies and as well going back to 1997 with the Canadian government bond portfolio and so forth. Um, as we get along today and talk about specifics of the portfolios, we'll keep it high level, but we can also dive deeper into the individual construction of the strategies and how they're conservatively managed and how we've actually taken opportunities uh, in these markets. And finally, uh, I wanted to give you a long-term picture on page seven of how your three funds have, developed, have performed over the last 10 years, ended March 31st. Put simply, we are looking on the vertical axis on return and the horizontal axis on risk. If you think about that sort of risk return framework, I've highlighted your three portfolios in red and their corresponding benchmarks in blue. And what you're looking for obviously is, is returns that, um, have exceeded the, the benchmark at, at lower risk. And so what we're very proud of the portfolio's performance over the last 10 years, hope you are as well. Certainly things uh, continue to evolve here. And so as we move along today, hopefully we'll give you some perspective of how things have transpired since the end of the first quarter. And if so, me if I can introduce you. Thanks, Taryn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to just spend a, a little bit of time on this page and really focusing um, some thoughts around three distinct time periods. Um, the past, so 2019, what our thoughts were, what we were doing in the portfolios, and why. The current, um, what's going on right now, how unprecedented um, some of the things that are going on right now, and then um, an outlook to kind of the future, um, where we may be going in the future, um, which is still, you know, relatively unknown because everything is so new. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, the performance of the funds up to the first quarter, uh, some of the changes that we made in the fund, and, and then um, open up to any uh, questions and answers. So I'm probably going to spend about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes just on, just on this slide right now. So um, thinking about to the past, uh, 2019, I mean, it seems so long ago, it's probably before any of us even knew what Zoom was or ever heard of Zoom. People spent time with their families, went out to dinner. Um, and really, from an from a investment standpoint, what we were really thinking about around the economic background was there was a trade war going on between U.S. and China. Manufacturing economic data was weak. Uh, growth was slowing, and really the debate in 2019 was the slowdown that we're seeing in the manufacturing world as a result of the trade war, would it spill over to the broader economy and push us into a recession? Meanwhile, while that backdrop was going on, um, equity markets were posting new highs, corporate bonds were as expensive as they have been in the past decade. And when you marry the economic background combined with the valuation background of high expensive corporate bonds, and you look at it in our framework that we use, and, and you know, just uh, some of you may not be feeling it, but when we're looking at our framework, we really look at four major inputs to making decisions on um, your portfolio with your money. Um, we look at the macro data, we look at individual company data, um, we look at technicals, where flows are, what the sentiment is, and we look at the price of securities. And when we looked at that back in 2019, you know, what we found was the macro data was poor, the bottom-up fundamental data was actually pretty good, the technicals or sentiment was mixed, but valuation or the price of securities was extremely poor. And so as a result of that, you know, what we thought is that we are going to be coming into a period of time in 2020 where we're going to have slower growth, but not a recession. 
We thought interest rates would continue to fall. We thought that we should be positioned on the low end of risk. And what that really means in your portfolios is, if you think of that we have a range of corporate bonds that we would buy, we are gonna stay on the low end of the range with the idea that we're not going into recession. If we had the view that we are going into recession, we would actually even have lower. And the next thing, which is not as, as applicable for your, your funds, but are also just to understand what our views were, is that the Canadian dollar needs to weaken. And it needs to weaken um, to help our growth, frankly, and help um, our exports. So that's what we were coming into 2019. And if we look at where we are today, so the first thing, to state the obvious, we are in a recession. Um, economic growth has stopped at an unprecedented pace. The depth of this recession will be bigger than any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. Uh, it will not be surprising if we hit an unemployment rate of 20 or 25%. And even, even the official rate that, um, that comes out will probably be understating the true rate because of some of the programs that the governments have rolled out to give companies money to keep people on payrolls. So regardless, um, it, it will be unprecedented. And as, as a result, financial markets re have reacted to this. Um, all credit allocations were impacted. In other words, they had negative returns. This is this, even the safest of the safest. Provincial bonds, numismatic bonds, high yield bonds obviously, and corporate bonds as well. Anything that had some sort of credit component uh, uh, underperformed uh, in the first quarter, especially in the month of March. We view these sell-offs as an opportunity to add risk into high quality companies in the portfolio. Um, it is why we are positioned on the low end of the risk, but again, we weren't positioned on the low end of the risk for a recession. Otherwise, we would have even lower credit weighting. Just to give you a sense of how fast the deterioration in risk assets, or specifically corporate bonds, happened, the decline in corporate bond prices, either you look at dollar terms or another way we look at it is through credit spreads or the, basically the interest rates that corporations are gonna be charged above the um, Bank of Canada rates. The widening that happened in the month of March, specifically in the last like three weeks of March, exclusively really, that widening or that de decline in price, the equivalent widening or decline in price took almost a year to happen during the financial crisis. That's how rapid this sell-off has been. And so what has been the reaction? I mean, the governments, so first of all, central banks around the world have gone back to their regular playbook, which was cut interest rates. So they all did, they've all done that across, across the globe. Um, they've introduced QE programs. So this is programs where they, the, bank, the central banks go in and buy bonds. Um, we didn't have one in the past in Canada, we didn't need one, but the Bank of Canada did introduce one a uh, couple weeks ago. And in that, that first round of quantitative easing, what they did was um, agree to buy uh, short-term banker acceptance, agree to buy commercial paper, agree to buy some short provincial debt to get some liquidity into the banking system. Uh, just basically an hour and a half ago, or just under an hour and a half ago, they've announced a new round of quantitative easing programs in which they will buy corporate bonds. So they will be owning um, financial instruments of Canadian corporates, um, just like the Fed announced uh, last week and just like the ECB has been doing for, uh, I think a year and a half, maybe even two years, the European Central Bank. They've also announced that they're going to be buying provincial bonds um, this morning. To, just to give you a sense, um, they've in instituted a program to buy $50 billion of provincial bonds. I'm not sure if municipal bonds will be included in there. I have a feeling it will, but they're scant on details. That is about half the issuance that the provincial bond, provincial bond market needs to do. And the $10 billion is equal to probably about 10% of corporate new issues. So, They've basically stepped in to provide liquidity to the financial systems, to drive down the cost of borrowing for people who need to borrow. But more importantly, what they did 
was they introduced liquidity into households. You know, in the in 2008, 2009, it was a banking crisis. So the banks needed money to be able to survive to the next day, to the next day, for months, for years, et cetera. What we have right now is a healthcare crisis. And, the, and where we need liquidity is actually not in the banking system. I mean, we need some and they've put some in there. But where we really need it is in individuals' hands. People need money to be able to go out and buy groceries, hopefully pay their rent, pay their mortgages, pay their bills, et cetera. Otherwise, we'll have a cascading effect of defaults throughout the whole country. Government stepped up. In the, in the U.S., they put a fiscal policy. That's about 10% of GDP. In Canada, they've done about 4% of GDP. They are putting literally cash in people's bank accounts at an unprecedented pace. I mean, you know, you all have jobs and, and you all um, know the, the infrastructure required to pay people and et cetera. I mean, to think about what they're doing and how fast they're getting cash in, whether it's right or wrong, I think we're going to figure that later on is another issue, um, but they are giving liquidity to the people who need it right now. So one of the things with the backdrop of what's going on now, how cheap assets have become, how central banks have stepped in on a fiscal policy side um, and on um, interest rate on a monetary policy side, that has given us the confidence to step in and buy credit or increase our credit exposure into high quality companies. Now for your funds, essentially we're limited to actually high quality companies across the board. And so what we've done um, in this period of time is really kind of think, thought about uh, four things. So first thing what we did in all our accounts was look at all the companies that we're invested in to still make sure we're comfortable owning them through the lens of a healthcare crisis. And that's not really how, you know, this wasn't on our radar screen in terms of like, we want to make sure we're investing in companies that can maintain this type of crisis. So we went through that process. The next thing that we did that may be of interest to everyone on the phone is ensure that we had enough liquidity in the funds. And when I say that, what that means is, if a client wanted to come out and get money, or if you need to come and get money to fund whatever you have, you're doing on your municipal level, we can provide it to you, and we're not a forced seller of something. The last thing I want to be, or we want to be, is have to force sell something at a terrible price and sacrifice returns um, because we are trying to get um, you know, money out for, for redemptions. The second thing, the reason why we made sure we had enough liquidity in the funds is to make sure that if clients want to rebalance into equities, that we can actually be able to give them money to go into equities as well. And so then with that backdrop, what we've done in general is gone and add to high quality companies. Um, and you know, with, with these funds, we're a little bit limited in terms of what we can do. So really everything's high quality, but you can think about if we had full um, range of things to invest in, it'd be things like utilities, telecoms, grocers, companies that we feel that we have good visibility that they will survive through the other end of this, regardless of what happens, because we don't really know, um, no one really knows really what's going to happen going from, uh, from from with the healthcare side of um, this issue. So that's where we are currently. What does the future look like? The future is, I mean, well, first of all, it's uncertain, but very big topic, big picture, the things that we are discussing and trying to think about what will happen um, have very divergent paths. So in my opinion, we're gonna come to a fork in the road eventually when everything settles down. And we're either going to have the status quo, so life goes back to the way it was. And when I mean that, it means individuals are living paycheck to paycheck, companies have a lot of debt on their balance sheet, governments have a lot of debt. That's scenario one in my mind. Scenario two is we go through a deleveraging cycle. So individuals decide to feel that, you know what, I actually need to make sure that if I have to go buy one month of groceries, I have enough money to go do that. And if I need to have two months 
of rent and payment, I need to do that. I can't just live paycheck to paycheck. In the companies who are looking at the range of scenarios, and, and, and maybe municipalities as well, but looking at the range of scenarios, you know, maybe they did a worst case scenario, our revenues fall by 20%. I can guarantee you no one was looking at scenarios where revenues fall to zero. And so usually there's an overreaction to this. So companies will start putting that, some of those maybe 40% decline in revenue. And, and what that'll end up meaning is that the hurdle rate for new investments are higher. It'll also drive companies to have less leverage on their balance sheet or to have more of a buffer than the past. And then governments, I mean, through individuals, are starting to have to start asking themselves, how can we run deficits when things are good and then expect to fund all the things that we've just funded for the next time we have a problem like this? And so governments may delever. And so, and the reason why this is important for what we're talking about today is it has big implications for investments. So number one, in a delevering world, interest rates are gonna stay low. Inflation will be low. Um, in a delevering world, corporate bonds actually do very well because companies are gonna have less debt on their balance sheet and there'll be less new supply of corporate debt because of that. And the big, the big unknown is what happens with equities. Um, generally in a deleveraging world, you could probably expect the uh, PE ratios, um, so the price divided by earnings, the, the multiple to decline. So it's not a great world for long-term returns. That's one fork. The other fork in the row is people say, you know what? This happened, the government gave me $2,000 a month, my company got, pay, got paid to keep me at work while I stayed at home. I didn't have to pay my rent for a couple of months, I got to defer my mortgage. Why do I need to actually do any of that? I could just keep going month to month because the next time there's a problem, I'm gonna get bailed out. And it's too early to know which fork in the road we're gonna do. Um, I think that the, the duration of what we're going on will drive that, the longer we have the duration, the more like we're in the delevering world, the shorter, um, maybe not. I'm of the view that um, this, the, the delevering world is more likely than not, but it's still too early to, to kind of decide that. So here's a portfolio um, as of the end of the quarter. Um, a couple, really the, the things to focus on here. Um, one, the first top row, the duration, Generally speaking, if um, the number on the, which is 2.46, if that number is less than the benchmark duration, it means that we're calling for interest rates to go down. This number is so, is so close to each other, it's, it's negligible. It has really no impact. So we're saying that there's, you know, we don't have a strong conviction view on where rates will go, or in this case, it's that, there's really no money to be made in the duration place. We don't want to take our risk there. We're out yielding the portfolio by just under 70 basis points or 66 basis points. And you can see that's the yield on the portfolio at 1.4% versus the benchmark at 74%. Our corporate exposure in this fund is at 41% um, relative to the benchmark that has none. I would think about in, in this portfolio, think about the range of our corporates going anywhere from, in a non-recessionary environment, so we don't, not calling for recession, anywhere from around high 30s, low 40s, so let's just say 40 to 50 is actually the max. If you looked at the portfolio um, three months ago, you would see that we've added a little bit of credit. Um, so you'd be like, oh, I thought we added risk. Like, how come we're not seeing the portfolio? And what we've really done is we owned a bunch of short bonds that were like one-year bonds, two-year bonds, and we bought a little bit longer-term bonds in the banks. And so it didn't change the weight, but it actually dramatically increases the risk profile of the portfolio to take advantage of when these become uh, more expensive game because they're really cheap. And... Um, while at the same time allows us to maintain liquidity because we don't actually have to go out and buy more bonds. We can still invest in provincial bonds, municipal bonds, and Canada bonds for the rest. So performance, um, long-term, since 97, um, we've earned uh, 
just under 4%, and the benchmark has just been under 3.8%. Uh, more recently, the performance in the fund uh, really has been just driven by the Q1, which is it's down 1%. I think when I looked um, this morning, and it's going to change rapidly after the Bank of Canada announcements, almost half of that underperformance has come back. And this is this is basically our allocation to bank bonds and provincial bonds and municipal bonds really underperformed in the month of March. And this is what I was talking about, that unprecedented spread gap, which we feel will normalize. And that's why we've actually bought more bonds to capitalize that. And then today, the Bank of Canada measures will, will bring that down uh, quite a bit. Again, um, the, the what I would look to highlight here is um, the corporate exposure at 66%. That's the fourth row on the table versus the benchmark at 50%. Um, again, the possible investments are, are limited um, based on the guidelines of the Municipal Act. You know, we're permitted to go up to 90%. I think it'd be very difficult for us to actually get there just given there are just so few names that um, fill the requirements. But we did add about 5% of corporate exposure in the quarter. And again, similar to what I said in the other fund, um, we, we went from shorter bonds to longer term bonds, which really, you know, almost it'll behave like we added actually another 10% without actually having to spend the cash and adding another 10% and still maintaining liquidity uh, in the fund. Again, here, long term, um, so since 2008, and and you know, the benchmark in here has changed over a period of time. The guidelines have changed, but um, the fund has earned uh, just over 4.6%. Again, in the last quarter, you see underperformance of um, 48%, uh, 48%, 0.48%, or just under half a percent. And when I look this morning, that's almost all reversed in the first, you know, 10 days or 12 days of this month, and I, I would imagine after today's announcement, that's actually probably turned to a positive number. So the, the funds that you invest in, we've taken advantage of, of the funds becoming cheaper. Um, we've made sure that we've made li liquidity, that if you need funds, um, they're there for you to come get at. It's not gonna be a question of like, sorry, we can't sell it. And um, we think we're well positioned um, to really generate alpha by how we've stepped in and bought risk. But I'll be, I'll, I'll just say this, just, this is a general comment in your funds and all our funds that we manage on the bond side, we have not gone to full on maximum risk. And mainly that's because, again, this healthcare crisis is really unknown at this time. And so if we do get another round of bonds, corporate bonds cheapening, we still have you know, dry gunpowder left to really go out and, and buy those and gain to add value significantly over the long term. So those are the, my main prepared comments. Um, that I wanted to talk about. Thanks, Somi. Keith, um, maybe we can open up the questions. We, um, we're happy to go anywhere and answer any questions that may be on the phone. Uh, I'll have a few just uh, of my own to start, start it off. Now, one of the issues that, that has come up in recent past is liquidity in, in, the, uh, in the markets. Uh, you've alluded to how the, the Bank of Canada is doing their thing. Can you just add a little bit of color about uh, how liquidity has, has impacted how you uh, manage the portfolio in the last uh, few months? Yeah, I think the big thing was really the last four weeks. Um, liquidity was extremely poor. So, you know, MFS, we've been set up to work from home for a long time. We've actually been running mandatory work from homes for, I think, three or four years. And so for us, I mean, it was relatively seamless, i tell you the truth. But even though banks had um, have some work from homes and offsite, they never really tested it. So what was actually very difficult at the beginning is you call up a dealer or a bank to trade a bond or buy something or get information. They didn't know what was going on because they had, they're used to having all their desks side by side. People can scream over, people can call each other. Now you had people in different locations. They didn't know what the price of anything was. They didn't want to buy or sell anything because they didn't know if they were making money or losing money. So everything really froze up. Uh, so that was, that was 
was one thing that we noticed. And even now, you know, doing a trade, which would take seconds, you know, it might take minutes. I know it doesn't sound like a big thing, but it slows everything down a little bit, which impacted liquidity. The, the other thing was um, it was difficult to buy corporate bonds because no one was selling also as well. So like that's, that, that, that was a hard part. Um, uh, that was a hard part as well um, in the sense of trying to add risk was difficult but everything was frozen. So it just required a lot more effort and work than it was in the past. The market is a little bit more liquid. They were at, at times, you know, one of the things that we did when we were on the low end of risk was we bought these shorter term bonds, which gave us some additional yield in the portfolio, but protected us if, if, if corporate bonds went down in price. But the idea was these bonds are really easy to sell. They're always liquid. The banks will all take them. Well, the banks weren't taking anything. So even these short bonds for the first one or two weeks, you couldn't sell it at all. Um, where now that's actually more functioning. Okay, very good. Uh, we have uh, uh, some additional questions. Uh, one is just uh, asking for your guess about the uh, the duration for this this correction uh, to take place. One thing will how long will it take to normalize? Is just to paraphrase the question. How long will what take to normalize? Uh, the financial markets. When you will be be out of uh, this uh, the, the current mode and you will have more uh, visibility uh, going forward to, to manage things in a more normal way. I don't think anyone knows that yet. I mean, the financial markets are behaving, and when I say financial markets, I'm really talking about equities, like this is, you know, things are gonna be back to normal sooner rather than later. And that could very well be right. I don't know. I mean, I can't say here and give you a date. Um, so we always go back to our process of the four things that the four pillars that we look at, you know, the macro, the technicals, valuations, fundamentals, and what we've been doing um, in the, you know, in general across all bonds and then again, applying them where we're restricted is buying companies that we feel that are going to um, going to be needed and are going to be there no matter what. One of the things that I'm not, you know, we're not comfortable with doing is there's an argument out there to go buy some very cheap energy companies because they're definitely going to get bailed out by the governments. And, you know, they very well may get bailed out by the governments, but it just doesn't fit in our investment framework. It doesn't, I do not feel comfortable making the decision to take, you know, your monies and put it into this fund to um, based on the idea that the government has to bail them out to make money. It's just not, it's, so one of the things because of that is, you know, maybe we could earn some additional returns if we bought some of these fund, these, these companies, but I know that the returns that we're getting are gonna be more stable and we have better visibility going forward. When things get back to normal, uh, I'm not sure yet. Not, and that's why we haven't gone to full risk and that's why we're really been buying high quality companies that were cheap. Okay, that's great. A um, couple more questions. Uh, one question is uh, about the downgrades. Has uh, anything in the portfolio been downgraded in the recent past? Uh, no. I think there's probably some auto finance companies that haven't been downgraded, but the outlook has gone from stable to negative, but nothing has okay. been downgraded in the portfolio yet. In general, in the Canadian bond market, we have had downgrades, um, but it had, Again, there are more, there's some companies that have gone to from investment grade to high yield. Um, there's some companies that have gone, dropped a notch in ratings, maybe even from A to triple B, uh, but not, not right now for the um, names in this portfolio. Okay, that's great. I think it probably attests to the, uh, the credit quality of the, of the portfolio and the segment of the market that you're in. Yeah, and I just wanna be one clear, clear on the downgrades. I mean, when, you know, when we've been looking, when we've been working with the analysts, you know, the primary concern right now, you know, when we're looking at credits is one, do they have enough liquidity to survive right now? That's number one. And two, um, do we think that they are the type of industry or business that are gonna be needed, that are infrastructure-like? i.e. telecoms, grocers, utilities, et cetera. Um, 
banks, frankly, they think the banks are in a great, a great position for a, for a bond investor. Um, will they be there? Will they be solvent going forward? The downgrades, I'm not as concerned about. And uh, the reason is that if the rating agencies change the way that they want to look at companies and not rate through the cycle, which is what they say they would do, um, I, we can't do, we can't control that. Now we're going to have a problem in this fund because of the municipal act. We probably have to be some sort of seller and we'll deal with them. So we haven't had to deal with this accounts, but other accounts, what we've told clients is that you just have to loosen up your guidelines. You know, if, if a telecom company decides to get downgraded by the rating agency, which it hasn't happened, I mean, I think we'd all agree, we think a telecom company is good as gonna last going forward. Um, so I'm not, for me, it's solvency, liquidity, the rating agencies do their things, um, you know, we, we'll deal with that at the other end. It's, it's, it is, um, it's not as, as a big of a driver um, yet. Okay, uh, just a, a follow-up question. You, ne you noted that you have been increasing exposure uh, to certain sectors, including utilities and telecom and grocers. Uh, but this, how have you been financing that? Where, how, what have you been selling down to uh, finance that? Yeah, so um, when we came into the year and we were on the lower end of our corporate exposure uh, in general in our fixed income funds, where we were was actually more overweight or we had a higher proportion in government Canada bonds. So a lot of the exposure that we've done to buy, go buy provincial debt, municipal debt, and corporate bonds have been funded through government Canada purchase, uh, government Canada sales. Okay. Um, another question here is uh, questioning about the yield curve. Um, it has uh, steepened dramatically uh, from the rate cuts, including, well, uh, the, the question here notes the 10-2 spread and uh, the 10-30 the spread. Can you just give some context about uh, what you're uh, uh, seeing in terms of long-term rates versus short-term rates? So short-term rates are going to remain low. Overall level of rates are going to remain low. I think that um, the common questions that we're getting is, do we think the Bank of Canada will go to negative overnight rates? I don't think so. Now, that's what Governor Polo is. I think, you know, he's been very clear about he's kind of at his lower bound. If we have a new governor, that may change. So we don't know that yet. But in the current framework, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, frankly. I don't think it's going to happen in the U.S. overnight rate go negative. That's the first thing. I think that what they are more likely to do, the Fed and the Bank of Canada, if they wanted to control rates, is to peg rates and to peg the curve at a certain slope. And I don't think we're there yet, but, you know, of all the policies that they've done, lowering rates, now buying, entering these programs where they're buying corporate bonds and provincial bonds, um, fiscal spending. I mean, this is only round one or two. I mean, we're gonna have more rounds. I think we're gonna have more rounds of fiscal spending coming up. And I believe at some point they're gonna, they're gonna peg a certain rate or peg the curve to be a certain slope. But rates will stay low for a long time this is very disinflationary that we're going to go to. I mean, if you think about conceptually 20 to 25% unemployment, I mean, that's a one in four or one in five people unemployed. It's a big, it's a big shock to the system. Okay. I mean, uh, just, uh, just for context, can you maybe pop up contrast how the bank of Canada and the Canadian government has responded uh, to the situation relative to the 2008 financial crisis? Um, well, we didn't have, so just first, first off is we did not have a quantitative easing program by the Bank of Canada in the financial crisis. So in other words, they didn't go out and buy corporate bonds, provincial bonds. They did provide a backstop of liquidity to the banks if they needed it. So in other words, if someone didn't want to lend you know, Royal Bank, TD, whoever, money on a short-term basis, they provided liquidity to them. So that's one a very big difference. I mean, we think about it, our central banks are now buying um, financial assets of corporations. It is not out of the purview to see, depending on what goes on in the future, 
them buying equity. I mean, Bank of Japan has been doing it for a while. Um, if they're buying corporate bonds, I wonder when, if, if we get to that stage and they need to, they may buy equity of companies as well. So that's, that's, um, that's one thing that's different. Two, on the fiscal side, um, 2008 to 2009 versus now, again, we are, individuals have a liquidity crisis right now. They have no pay. They are unemployed or not getting paychecks. Um, the bank, the, the federal government is injecting liquidity into people's homes. And again, at an unprecedented pace, like people are applying for um, these programs and getting money in their bank account within days. Uh, just, it's actually quite amazing. Like whether you agree with the programs or not, it's quite amazing. Both parties, um, you know, uh, the conservatives and liberals have been doing things that have been getting money in liquidity in households, in businesses, and just administratively, I'm surprised they've been able to do it so well. So th those are the big differences, I think, um, compared to 2008, 2009. Okay, wonderful, Sam. Uh, one last question before we close it off. Um, about um, uh, portfolio tur uh, turnover, in terms of the amount of transactions you're doing in the portfolio, has it, uh, what's, what's normal course? Um, is it a high turnover portfolio or low? And how has this changed in, in, in recent, uh, recent weeks, months in relation to the, uh, the COVID outbreak and circumstances? I mean, you know, I, I think if we want, we can get you the actual turnover numbers. I, I don't actually know the exact numbers. I don't look at it, but I can just tell you, we don't really turn over the portfolio that often. Uh, it's just not, it's not how we, we kind of manage money. We look at making investments and investments for the long term. That being said, um, I bet you if, I, we, if we were to look, the month of March and the, and the first two weeks of April have probably had the highest turnover we've probably maybe even ever had. And I don't even know. I'm just, just going by kind of my feeling of what we've done. And that's because if you think about it, we had 40% of, you know, in, in, the, in the government bond fund, we had 40% of allocation to banks or to corporates. And they're all, not all, but a, a good chunk of them were one or two year bonds. And we've taken all those and moved them to four, five, six-year bonds. That's rolling over a, a major chunk of the portfolio. We've gone and added a lot of provincial bonds, so selling Canada. So in the short term, we've done what we were kind of set up to do coming the year. We were low on the risk, and we wanted to add risk, and we've been doing that over the last four or five weeks. And because of that, turnover has been higher. Uh, you know, going forward... Um, you know, going forward, I, you, I would expect to see, you know, turnover kind of go down, go down now. We've done a lot of the, the positioning that where we are comfortable being given what's going on in the economy today. So if we're in this environment, I mean, I can, if we're in this environment a month from now, I can see us doing no trades, um, frankly. So it's just, I don't, I don't want to give a, a look into the future because I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but in general, um, in general, uh, turnover was much higher in the last uh, month. It should be coming down, given we've done a lot of the heavy lifting already in the portfolio. And That's Keith, we can get you those. We'll get you those statistics. Yeah, no, no. It's just more, more the, uh, the the tone that's important. And and you know, I would characterize it as this is a all weather portfolio um, set up for for long term investing, uh, long term returns. Uh, but yeah, you have, you've got to be responsive to the circumstances and uh, additional trading is absolutely uh, a requirement. Okay, I'm going to squeeze in one, one more, uh, uh, an interesting question just because, because I want to know the answer too. And it may not have uh, much to do directly with your portfolio, but uh, it, it's maybe a personal thing for everyone on the call. Interest rates have, have, have fallen in recent weeks, recent months. They've been plunging. Why aren't mortgage rates going down with them? They will tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, after the, I'm just telling you that right now, after the Bank of Canada's announcement today, so the reason why is that, it, so I guess this be, let me answer more properly. Um, so the mortgage rate, it has really two components to it. One is a good proxy is the five-year government of Canada rate, which has come down. That's one. The second part is, um, how much banks can borrow at. So if, if banks can go issue a bond at 2% over 
the government Canada five-year rate. Let's just say, for argument's sake, again, the government Canada five-year rate was 1%. So their borrowing cost is 3%. They're going to sell you a mortgage at 3.5%, and they make the spread difference. What's happened um, in this period of time when all risk, all kind of corporate bond assets got cheap, that, that cost of financing for them gapped out. So even though rates have come down, they've, only, they've come down, they've been down for a while, the cost of the bank's borrowing has gone up, which means mortgage costs have gone up. Now, because the Bank of Canada has stepped in now and starting to buy corporate bonds, we expect um, bank financing costs, as well as all corporate financing costs, and provincial financing costs, and municipal financing costs, have all, will, will come down from where they were two weeks ago. And you should see that translate into the mortgage market as well. That's great. That's a very clear answer. Okay, I will uh, close off the uh, the presentation. I want to thank uh, our presenters and all the uh, the attendees for for calling in. Um, again, we're always open for for any questions from investors about the portfolios, and we're always welcome to uh, you're always welcome to, to reach out to uh, to myself or. Uh, water directly and we'll uh, get answers to whatever questions you have. Again, thank you for attending our, our webinar and um, until the next time.